You and me, peace, tranquility, halfway around the world, there's hundreds of thousands of people in shelters monitoring news reports to see if there's going to be a nuclear meltdown in their area, whether they can go home or not. News reported this morning that now they're finding radioactivity in some of the food, some of the water, and some of the milk that they drink. In the Middle East, a quarter way around the world, we woke up and found a plane being shot out of the air in Libya. So we find out it looked like it might be one of the actual people who are rebelling against the government to try to get Gaddafi out of there. Back at home, we've become a laughingstock to many of the leaders around the world. What has happened in the last three months is absolutely astounding. I can't ever recall a time in history that so much has happened so quickly that has changed the face of the earth by what you and I are witnessing today than has happened in these first three months of this year. We've done quite a number of sermons in the last couple months dealing with the aspect of the change of events that's reshaping the world we live in today. We began back in January 1st, 2011. As I watched and listened to the news, and I listened to Hillary Clinton, by the way, if you went back and you got the tape from December, the news was coming out that, that Egypt is in unrest and something has to be addressed. She makes a report. They're fine. They're supporting the United States. There's no problem in Egypt. Amazing. When you hear these stories, looking back. I listen to the financial experts, the government officials, telling us how great we're doing now and how 2011 is going to be a prosperous year and that we're over the hurdle. And as they began to look to their elections in 2012 and began to position themselves, I looked at the real news of what was taking place from everything that I could find, and I talked to my wife. I got up one morning, and I said, they're lying to us again. I said, we're not in good shape. We haven't recovered from the economic crisis. I said, there is Middle East turmoil coming. I said, and we need to address these issues right now. And so we began January 1st talking about we're being lied to. And you probably got that tape, the normalcy bias. The fact you're going to get several tapes in the last few months that we've been dealing with, this will probably be number five. And if you go back, you'll say, well, Tom talked a little bit about this already, and I did. But what we're doing now is because the, the world is changing week by week, month by month, and actually day by day. You go home tonight, it'll change by the time you go home. By the time you get a message out, there's not even the same message anymore. In fact, we had to go back in and redo Normalcy Bias 2 because we had a problem with sound. And when we did it, I said, wow, all these things that we predicted in this has already happened. And we had to go back and update and make the changes and get it going out there. So now, when you look at all the different aspects of what we're coming, you will see that what we're focusing on is a different focus that's going to address your life and my life and the church as we deal with these issues from various angles. First of all, you have the news. You have to watch what in the world is taking place in the news. How does that affect you and I? Second, you have to be able to go into the Bible. Is this biblically related? Does it have any news with prophecy? If not, discard it. And you go through these things and you try to weigh out what God says. And he says that his church will have the, the, uh, the gift of being able to discern between right and wrong and be able to discern between what's true, what's not true, and have the gift of understanding events in relationship to prophecy. And, we, and we've been blessed in the last few years, if you go back, if you will timestamp when the sermon came out and then go back and look at the events, you will see that God has blessed us to be in the, in the foremost front of what was taking place before things happened. And in one of the sermons, I actually went through and showing. And I did that not for a reason to boast or to brag, because all glory goes to God, but to have people saying, listen, these things are happening that affects your life. When you hear something, just don't throw it out the door. There's a reason these things are happening, because God says he will do nothing lest he reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. That's you and I. And I'm blessed to be able to get emails coming to me, news articles coming to me that I don't have on my own, that people have said, hey, listen, what about this? And you put all these things together and we're able to get focused on what's taking place. Just last week, we talked about the importance of the local church. 
I hinted a little bit about that in the, in the uh, leadership program that I did this morning, that you and I have probably, I don't know of any other job right now that I could think of that's more important than the local congregation at the end time. I can't think of anything more important than the job that God's laying on our shoulders. And I focus that entire message on that aspect. Now you think about that. What is going to be more important than caring for God's elect when they come out of the walking wounded during that tribulation? That job is going to be the most important job he has given any of his churches in modern times. That job has been put on our shoulders. So we're focusing on that. Now, what am I focusing on today? I thought about all these different angles. I said, you know, there's one area we haven't covered yet that I can remember. And that's, you know what that is? Doing without. I haven't thought about that a whole lot. We have to begin to be ready for what? The fall. Now, I want to ask you something. When you got up for church today, what did you think about when you went to church? You know, I, I said, well, you know, like last year, last week, I went to specifics. I want you to get that sermon. Because, see, I never thought a lot about that, what I did when I'm going to go to church. You know, I have to get up and I got to get dressed and, you know, do I look okay? And how far do I have to go? There's a time coming. When you get up to go to church, you know what you're going to be looking for? Will they be watching where I meet today? Who's going to be looking to find out what's going on? Or are they going to try to come in and stop our church meeting this week? Because I can look at the modern New Testament times and during the apostolic era, they went through hiding to do the work. Satan's going to be out there and he's going to come after God's elect. And he's going to be coming to stop what we're doing because the laws are changing. And they're changing rather quickly. So now, are you ready for the fall? Are you prepared? Now, you can ask that question. People say, oh, yeah, yeah. If I ask specific questions, people say, oh, no, I never thought about doing that. Now, so you go through the process of being ready to go without, and you're going to be tested to do that. God is going to gradually draw back. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble is going to slightly precede from all indication, if not parallel, but slightly precede the tribulation. That means you and I who live in modern day Israel are going to go through times of trouble and turmoil that is going to make us go without. And you and I are going to have to focus on how well we handle going without. Now, I want to go through a few questions here. What are you looking for when you go to church? Now, I don't expect you to answer this right now. What are you looking for when you go to church? Are we witnessing what we have always witnessed when we consider the news? We look at the news today. When we look at that news today, is what we're seeing what we've always seen? Because I know there'll be people who will get this tape and say, man, I've heard this for 40 years. I've heard it all my life. Really. Are the events that are happening today the same that they have been for the last 30 or 40 years? Or is there a difference? I want to bring your mind to something else that maybe we haven't thought about as we move in toward the end time with what the Bible says. So let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 and verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The creation, God's creation, says is waiting for the manifestation for the sons of God. What are we looking at when we're beginning to see what happened over in Japan? Were not the events part of God's creation that began to erupt? What have we witnessed in the last couple of years? I just briefly this morning, I was, I was putting this sermon together. I thought about the, the, the earthquake and the tsunami that took place in the Indian Ocean. Back at the end of 2005, I think it was Jan December 26, if I'm not mistaken, 2005. Then into 2006, a quarter of a million people died. A quarter of a million people. Just, just last year, 2010, in Haiti, they estimate now that the death tolls up of around 200,000 people. As the sickness and disease now began to set in because they couldn't bring in what they needed for, for water and for health. 
and thousands of people continue to die. But the volcano, was it Iceland or Greenland? When that began to erupt and it spewed out all the dust that was beginning to go across Europe and caught countless billions of dollars and disrupted air traffic and growing of land and, and plants in that area for months. And then I began to look at what I remember seeing just a few days ago. was called the Ring of Fire. You know what the Ring of Fire is? Part of God's creation. It's the plates that's underneath the ocean in the Pacific. And the Ring of Fire runs across from Japan all the way around up north to the Arctic and all the way back down to, we know where? California. And they began to notice that there's a movement going on in the Ring of Fire and they have shown two major earthquake spots in that ring of fire that began over near where Japan is uh, uh, just recently, almost a year ago, another one. And now they're beginning to see some of the movement and shifts in these little tremors that are taking place by the hundreds. And they're expecting the next one, the shift in California. They're expecting the possibility. And they said within, they have no doubt within the next 24 years, is what they're predicting now, that they'll have at least one, if not both, of the, uh, I don't know the technical names for these plates, but there's one close to shore and there's one offshore. They said the one offshore will be more deadly than the one onshore because when it shifts, there's enough pressure that's on that that they expect not what we've seen in Japan with a 30-foot wave or a 32-foot wave, but they anticipate a 100-foot wave could come out of that shift which will move into the coast all along the west coast of California, literally wiping out millions of people before they have a chance to move out of harm's way. Now, it says here that all creation is waiting for us. We read the Bible that God says before our chance comes, there's things that has to happen. Look what it says in verse 22, same chapter. For we know that the whole creation groans and travail and pain unto now. Now, what do you think is taking place here? Is there any relationship, is there any correlation to what's going on right now to what God says would happen to mankind if it sinned against him? Now, what am I referring to? Let's go back to the Old Testament and see what God was talking about and seeing if what we're looking at in the events that's happening today is any different than what we have seen 20, 30, 40 years ago. Back in the Old Testament, let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. See what God said was going to happen if we disobeyed him. Leviticus 18, I'm going to begin reading in verse 24. It says, Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these things the nations are defiled. So if I went back and I looked at the beginning of this chapter, and I would specifically pick up from 19 to 24, I would look at the numbers of these sins that God talked about that they were doing. Abominable things against God Almighty. But even though it was being done against God Almighty, it, something happens. Something happens to the land mass that God has created that it says is in travail. Now when God created this planet, it was recreated, as we see from Genesis, to where it was perfect. It was at peace. Everything was in its place. There was not a sin until mankind brought it in to this planet. And, and so now we're seeing, look what God says here. He says, and the land is defiled. How do you defile land? Interesting, isn't it? Does that say, how does mankind defile the land? Well, of course, you can look at what well, a growing season if they don't let it rest on the Sabbath. But God's talking about more than that. God's talking about our sins that even his own creation of mankind, the earth itself, hates. That it can no longer deal with. He says, and the land is defiled. That you and I can live in a land. A land of promise. A land of opportunity. And we can defile the land that he has given to us. He says, and I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. And the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. That's interesting. When you read that, vomits out. What did we just witness over there in Japan? I listened to some of the experts who know this type of stuff, and they watched, they said, as the earth opened itself up approximately 150 miles long, 50 miles wide, 
and lifted up and began to spew out, created that tsunami which went in. I saw a picture in one of the uh, videos of this other opening where it was the earth was opened up and began to swallow up the water. Did you see that? It was a whirlpool in the middle of the ocean, sucking in who knows how many hundreds of thousands of millions of gallons of water into the earth. And there was a ship, a boat, some kind of small cruiser of some type, who was right on the experts watching that tidy bowl thing go around and around. And as he was puttering along, trying to keep from going into the middle of that mass. Now, what is going on with the earth? When God says it will vomit itself out, what do you do when you vomit? Well, that's kind of disgusting to talk about. I don't understand that. But what does your body do? Something vile has entered. Something has made you sick. The body can't accept what just took place. So what does it do? And through this, this huge surge, and you feel it. In fact, if you vomit at any length of time, your whole rib cage is sore and your back's aching from it. And you have this horrible smell and, and that goes through it. And it just spews out. And you'll vomit. And it just sometimes the force of that will just throw it for, for feet away from the body, right? God says, because of the sins of mankind, the earth will vomit us out. Or are we witnessing the beginning of some of the stages of what God promised would precede the return of Jesus Christ? Or is what we're witnessing today business as usual? We've always had earthquakes. We've always had wars. We've always had rumors of wars. I dare say that what we're witnessing today with the frequency, with the power, and with the magnitude that I honestly believe that what we're witnessing to is we're moving closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ. And God says these things are going to happen. Look at verse 28. It says, The land that the land spew you not out when you defile it as it spewed out the nations which were before you. And you can look back and you'll see that God took and removed all those people. And we've seen indications where mankind defied God and the earth opened up and swallowed them. We've seen cases like that throughout the scriptures. We see in the New Testament, God says in Revelation, it's going to happen again. We've seen it happen in the book of Acts. Sometimes we don't realize that how the earthquake began. What happened with the earthquake with Peter? He was in prison. The earth shook. The gates opened up. And Peter was gone. So God says that he's going to use his creation to protect his people. He will also use his creation. He's going to spew out the evil that destroys mankind. So we're witnessing all that going on right now. Look at chapter 20. It talks a little bit more about this. Leviticus 20, verse 22. It says, Yea, shall therefore keep all my statutes and all mine ordinances, and do them, that the land where I bring you to dwell in spew you not out. So God will use his land to spew us out or to spew out the evil that takes place. When you heard all these things, did you ask yourself, am I ready for Jesus' return? So we need to ask ourselves that. And your answer needs to be yes. You know, it can't be any other. And if you're not, if you're in doubt, it needs to get to where it is yes. And you know what else you need to do? We need to ask God to help us. Like, like uh, Philip did. Was it Philip or uh, Thomas? That one, Thomas. I, so I should remember. That's my name, Thomas. You know what he said? He's about faith. He says, yes, I have faith. Please help my unbelief. In other words, you and I say, yes, Father, we're ready. But man, I don't know. Right? That doubt can hurt us. So we need And How do you know if you're ready or not? So well, how do I know if I'm ready or not? So I don't, I don't know how to even ask the right questions sometimes. How does a person ask themselves if they're ready or not? You can say, I will follow you, Lord, till death. Peter said it. He wasn't ready, was he? He wasn't ready at all. God's going to let you know that you're ready because you're going to be tested. You're going to be tried. And you're going to go through some fires before you get to that point. So that when you get there, you have been through what you need to go through to get into his kingdom. I said, well, you know, when, when I, I'm ready for a hurricane, how do I know I'm prepared for a hurricane? Now, some of you live on the coast. You get to prepare for hurricanes, too. Along the Georgia coast, down in Florida. You go through, you've been through some of this stuff. 
You don't have to live on the coast. What do you do when you prepare? Well, I looked at it and said, well, you know, there's actually phases. I said, you know, there are actual phases that you prepare when disaster comes. A Red Cross worker prepares one way. A fireman prepares one way. The individual who's preparing for the disaster to come, you and I are preparing for a disaster to come. It's going to be bad. <laughs> it's not, you're not going to get away from it. You can't run from this one. This is going to come on this whole earth. So you got a problem just like I do. How do we prepare when you can't run? What are you going to do? I thought about the hurricanes. I said, well, you know, beginning of stage, uh, there's certain things I can do. I, I, well, I've got to get lamps. I wrote some of this down. I said, you, you can probably say, well, you missed one, Tom. And I probably did miss a lot of them. Oil for the lamps, because you're not going to have power in many cases. Uh, the wicks, we need special more wicks for it. You need oil, flashlight, batteries. Uh, now you realize that the, hur the hurricane could put you out of electricity for more than just a couple of days. Everything you got in your freezer is going to be rotted. It's kind of funny, the last hurricane we went through with Hurricane Katrina, we had garbage in the kitchen. The garbage man's not coming, the hurricane's on its way. So my wife says, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't want it to stink up the house while we're gone. So I put it all out in a little plastic greenhouse. You know, I got this plastic greenhouse out there made out of PVC pipe and plastic over it. And I don't know what I was thinking. Here's a 165 mile an hour current hurricane coming. And I got this garbage bag with a, with a garbage can in the middle of this plastic greenhouse. My wife it looks at me like I'm a crazy man. So I guess I was. I said, I'll put it in a greenhouse so it wouldn't stink up the house. But I didn't want it to get blown all over. So I stuck it in this little greenhouse. By the way, the greenhouse made it. I don't know how the green. Uh, this, uh, this is a true story. I'm coming home from the hurricane. If you hadn't heard this story, this is really, this is true. I've got these trees, must be 100 foot pines in front of my house. They're gone, wiped out. One fell over, touched the guy's house, broke half and went through his roof, lifted up the cement on the thing. I got this PVC, you know what PVC is, plastic pipe. And I got plastic stretched over with, with staples in it, in my backyard. And I got a wood fence all the way around. I come home, my next door neighbor says, come here, Tom, you got to see this. I go in the back, there's wooden fence all the way around my backyard, six foot stakes, four by four wood into it. It's ripped up, torn down, boards blown all over the place, and there's this little plastic greenhouse isn't touched. <laughs> now, to tell you the story is my freezer now has been a week. Everything in it is rock. Blood's running down the, the, out of, into the garage. You open it up, I had to go outside and throw up. But the garbage bag was in the greenhouse and didn't stink up the house. <laughs> right, so that's stage one. You know, we've got to get all these things ready, right? Now, is that going to save me when the hurricane comes? No, but it does prepare me. How do you do this spiritually? Now, what, are we, what is Tom talking about here? Preparing like this. All right, stage two. What do we do? We begin watching. If the hurricane is getting closed, what do you do now? Now we're boarding up windows. Boarding up doors. We're securing anything that's loose, anything that's out. And we forgot to take the trampoline. Well, the trampoline's up high and it creates like a wind sail. So when the hurricane came, my trampoline was a few neighbors down. And it was a big old mess that's out there. So you began to pretend on the other. Now, phase three. What is phase three? Phase three is if it's coming, you have done everything you can. You've gathered up whatever important papers you've got. And what are you willing to do? You're willing to leave it all behind and lose it. Well, why? Because you have no other choice. Now, that's what I'm leading to. Spiritually, God tells us that we have to prepare. We have to be willing to let it all go to serve Him. The truth of the matter is, you don't have any choice anyway. When that hurricane comes, it's coming. If you don't get out of the way, you don't get to safety, you are in trouble. The hurricane that we're talking about is going to ensue this whole world. There are stages that we have to do to prepare for its coming. The last stage is you must be willing to give up everything to follow God. And it may be that you will be tested to do that. How do you begin with that? What do you, what do, you do? Now, I've heard somebody say, well, don't worry about storing up anything because that's not trusting God. Really? I said, where did that come from? That's not the Bible I'm looking at. I want to go take a look at something here. I want to ask you a question. If you had to prepare for the coming return of Jesus Christ, how long should you prepare for? 
Well, I don't know when he's coming <laughs> to begin with. But I do know one thing. Before he gets here, I've got a seven-year window that i got to at least look at. As a minimum, a seven-year window. It could be cut short. It could stay within three and a half years. I understand that. But look, there's a seven-year window. Let's, let's see here. Jan, Daniel chapter 12. Go to Daniel. Daniel chapter 12. <clears throat> and let's show you what, what God says. Verse 11. It says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. We're talking about three, three and a half years here from the time that the abomination of the sacrifice stops. So that's probably from what we're looking at, from what the church understands during that three and a half year period. But there has to be a period that the sacrifice starts. So we're looking for a sacrifice to be set into place. And the Bible says that'll probably be, if we look at duality, another three and a half years during that time. And we can go back. But while I'm here, I'm going to jump around a second. Then we'll go back a couple chapters. Because look what it says. Verse uh, 7. We're talking about the time, times, and a half time of God scattering his, the power of his holy people. And by the way, that's one of the sermons that I gave that you need to get. Because we're showing disconnects going on all through the Bible. But well, the Bible seems to be saying one thing, and we're taught to talk about the famine of the word. There's not going to be no preaching and teaching going on. Really, is that what the Bible says? You're going to be shocked to find out that ain't what the Bible says. You know what it does say? It says the famine of the hearing of the word. In fact, what the Bible says is during those three and a half years, there's going to be more preaching going on than ever was going on. Because why? Look at verse 10. And many shall be purified and made white during that period, and, and the wicked shall do wicked. And the wicked shall not understand, but the white shall understand. We're talking about the three and a half years. We talked about it this morning. We're talking about the time of tribulation when the innumerable multitude comes out. Because what's going on? The two witnesses are out there. And they're going to catch everybody's attention. Well, it's the power of the holy people. So what's, what the Bible's telling us is not there isn't going to be the word going out. Because there's going to be going out with more power than it ever went out with. Less people will hear the word. Because they're going to go seeking the wicked. And doing what the wicked says. So you read it for yourself and see if that doesn't, doesn't say, hey, that's what the Bible actually says. Because all these people are coming out of the tribulation. It's the famine of the hearing of the word. So as we move closer and closer to the end time, there'll be less and less people hearing what God has to say. But there'll be at that time more and more people being converted. So what is God talking about? So we went through all those various aspects and showing how the Bible says, well, during that time, they're not hearing God saying where people aren't going to be getting together because the Bible says here they're going to be the scattering of the power of the holy people. Is it saying that you guys aren't going to be meeting anymore? Absolutely not. It's saying just the opposite because Hebrews tells us, forsake not the assembly as the matter of some is, ever so much more as you see that day approaching. So on the one side, it says there's a scattering going on, but we said we have to get closer than ever. See, we're talking about the connection. But actually what the Bible is actually telling us, the same thing. And so I go through all those various, what it sounds like, disconnects to put them all together to show how important your job is going to be. And how what God's really saying is that during all this time, <clears throat> the power of the local church, the power of a national work, it's not going to be there. And that's what we missed. The power of the people, look at, look at worldwide. Man, what a time when they had three universities or a thousand ministers. And there wasn't a time of day that they weren't on TV somewhere. That power is going to be gone. But the word of God will go out. And you and I will become into a more important role during that time because God's going to be bringing all those coming out of that tribulation to you to be cared for. So it's an important message and part of our understanding. But we got to get past this stage if we're going to get to that stage. So in other words, how do I get to that stage if I can't get past this? If I'm not willing to count it all as a loss and just let it go and do what God says, he, he may not ask you to give it all up. But you've got to be willing to if you need to. And that's the hard thing. How do you know that you are? Peter thought he was. God will, God will bring you through that. So now see, now let's go back just a couple of chapters in verse chapter 9 and verse 27. It says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice of oblation to cease. And this is part of where we have the duality. And this is duality in a couple areas. This is where the church believes and has always been taught that the sacrifice will be established, 
And from the time of the establishment of the sacrifices, there would be a seven-year period. The sacrifices will be cut off through the abominations uh, at that time for the three and a half years tribulation. Also what we're looking at here, when Jesus Christ was cut off in the midst of the week. So if we go back and we look at the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he was crucified on a Wednesday. And you can categorically prove that from Scripture. There's no doubt about that. There's one more area of this of duality that you need to understand. Is we took the 7,000 year plan of God. And we went through all the way through from the time of Adam and Genesis all the way through to the end before the new heaven and new earth. We had 7,000 years. If you put the time when Jesus Christ was crucified, it would be in the, th in the midst of the 7,000 years, three and a half thousand years is when Jesus Christ was crucified. He was also crucified in the midst of the 7,000 year plan. So it's quite astonishing what God has actually done with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So now, we can say comfortably, at least seven years I have to be prepared. If you don't have a job for seven years, can you exist? Well, suppose you're not working for seven years. Well, what can you do? Where are you going to get your food? You think the government's going to give it to us? Oh, they're doing a good job of giving it to us now, aren't they? Do you know that the homes, when I said at the Feast of Tabernacles, there were 42,000 people on, on food stamps, 42, 42 million people on food stamps. You know it's up to 44 million now? In less than a year, 2 million more people have gone on food stamps. But things are getting better, they're telling us. All right. I, I hear that, I say, this is astonishing. And people are buying it as they jockey themselves to a position. So let's suppose the Bible's telling us we had like seven years. How are you going to prepare for seven years? I don't know that I can get enough food stored away for seven years. And if I did, I got a feeling the bugs are going to eat it. They got a lot of bugs out there now. I don't know if you ever noticed it. You can have it, you can buy rice and you can buy stuff and keep it in your cabinet for a few months before you know it. Inside those plastic bags, you got bugs. Where'd they come from? How are we going to store what we need to store? But we have to store something. We have to do something to prepare, right? Your preparation in phase one, like a hurricane, cannot be your mode of salvation. Your preparation of preparing for the end time to get you through a period of time of whatever staples that you can save is not salvation. I want to clarify that. But does that mean that I don't save up anything? Does that mean I don't prepare? What else do I prepare for? I'm going to get my bills down as much as I can get them down. I'm going to take and pay off everything I can possibly pay off now. And if you don't, what's going to happen is you're going to lose it anyway. Because the evaluation of the dollar is going to shift before Christ returns. Your buying power is going to get a lot less. Did you see the news this week? The cost of food in one month rose 4.3%. The highest increase in one month in four decades. We reported that just a few months ago. The QE2 that's going to help everybody with all this extra money. What a joke that was. Keep printing $600 million while the government tells us, the presidential administration, how we're going to cut back. We're going to cut back. Hey, listen to this cutback. We're cutting back $400 million over the next five years. There you go. That'll fix everything. $400 million, and I get so sarcastic when I get into this kind of stuff because anybody who listens to this nonsense and believes it deserves what they're going to get. And you know what? And God's going to give it to them. When you listen to our government haggle over $2 billion a week, cut back and how hard that's going to be on this country, let's see, I don't have to be a rocket scientist, $2 billion a week, that's $104 billion a year. How much is our debt this, this year? $1.6 trillion we're going to add to the already $14.3 trillion. Now they're sitting back talking about, well, we can't even do $40 billion this month because that's going to be hard. That's nonsense. And I'm listening to this. Do you realize that our government has to has to raise the debt limit just to break even at the end of this year by one point six trillion dollars? That means we've got to raise our debt ceiling from fourteen point three to sixteen trillion just to break even at the end of the year. Can you imagine that? That's not counting next year. China knows it. The rest of the countries knows what's going on. And you're beginning to see that diverse of support to the United States. Do you know the QE, the QE2, the government 
has supported his own debt. That's like, you, you got a husband and wife here? <laughs> Put this in perspective here. So you go out and borrow money. Who's going to lend it to you? What's your wife? Where she's getting the money? When she's going to the back room, she's going to print it. And then you're going to take it and you're going to go spend it. Well, that's what the government's doing. 30%, only 30% came from foreign investors this time of the QE2. At one time it was 70%, then it was 50 now it's 30%. That means the American government is buying its own debt, 70% of that $600 billion. And you know what they're talking about now? QE3. In other words, QE2 ain't working either. We're still having a lot of trouble. There's a lot of faults. There's a lot of debt. There's more bankruptcies. They expect another foreclosure of 1.6 million homes this year. This year. Another. But we're doing good, they told us. Now, you put things in perspective. I mean, who, who's lying to who? The rest of the countries know that this is a joke. And they're just, they're just slowly separating themselves from us. China was gradually buying other people's debt instead of the United States now. They peaked right after, we, and we said it would, in, in 2007, we said China will gradually now begin to distance itself because they're not going to go through this again. And in 2008, they peaked how much they were buying, and now they have less debt than they had before by money. They're slowly separating themselves from us, and so is the rest of the world. Now, the rest of the world is looking at us like we are this weak powerhouse that has absolutely no power. Hillary Clinton, our Secretary of State, could not get an audience with the Saudi kings and dignitaries and the princes of that nation. Couldn't get a meeting. She couldn't get one with the king of Egypt before he fell. Couldn't get a meeting. And now they're listening to us as it's just as weak. And, you know, the Bible said that that was going to happen. And we're in the middle of it right now. Now, the, about the greed of the American public. The greed of the American public. Did you watch the oil when all this took place? When Japan collapsed through, not Japan collapsed, but when they went through their turmoil, the earthquake, the tsunami, and now the nuclear, this is pretty serious. I listened to the news media says, watch the price of oil now, and the price of oil dropped. Why did the price of oil drop? Because the greed of the American people, the greed of those who run the stock exchanges. What are they looking at? They are looking at the world from the perspective of what's going in my pocket. What did they see? They've seen a country who consumes oil won't need oil for a while. So they began dumping oil. So the price of oil dropped almost $5 a barrel while everybody was predicting it was going to rise. Then you got this little tiny company, country next to Saudi Arabia. Begins to end up surges, who's, who's actually a U.S. ally. And we're losing that battle too, by the way. We've lost Jordan. We've lost Egypt. We've lost respect. Now this little bitty country, Saudi Arabia, is not going to let them go through what they're going through. They're not listening to the United States. They won't give our president an audience either, by the way. When they began to disrupt, there went the oil again. Why? Because they knew that the oil disruption from Saudi Arabia affects the rest of the world. So what they did, they buy back in and watch the oil go back up. You and I are pawns to the greed of the kings, as God talks about, the kings of the earth. And that's what's going on around the world. Everybody's looking at what's in it for them. Let's bring it home now, back to the United States. What's going on with our government and its debt? They don't care what the debt is. They don't care where it's going to, as long as it doesn't happen on their watch. You know what they're doing right now? They're preparing themselves for 2012, who's going to be in the office next. And you and I are pawns. And God says, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. They've done everything. God's going to give them this global catastrophe that's coming. It won't be one world government. But it will be one girl. Uh, one world is for his united effort, because that's what's coming. And all these things are uniting together, because these governments will never be one government. That won't happen. But they will be united in an effort to get the money and the greed. And we're watching that happen now. And God says the earth's spewing them out. So you can watch more and more of these disruptions take place in the near future. And boy, if California goes. Katie bought the door then because that is going to be one major catastrophe that you think it was hard to get Louisiana back. You're not going to get them back. And that is huge and that is major.
Back to the preparation. Where are you going to prepare it in? What is God telling us? Let's go back to Genesis. We've got a little bit of an example in the duality of time. A little bit of an example. I don't know the time we started on that clock. So if you'll give me about 10 minutes so I can wrap up, we don't run over, trying to keep it within one hour. Genesis 41. Genesis chapter 41. What I'm trying to do is, I know I'm, I'm going through a long series of things that's happening around the world because I'm trying to get us to understand something. We have to focus our mind to be ready to go without, be ready to walk away from anything and everything that we own to serve God. We've got a picture that there's a time coming that there's only a limited span of space that's going to take place. That time's coming real soon. I don't know how much longer, but when you look at prophecy, there's so many things pointing that period between 2015 and 2020. I think we're going to be in some deadly times. I don't know how much longer we can get past in the United States 2015 with the debt that we have. Social Security said so by 2017, they're actually putting out more than they can take in. Well, they actually spent more than they got. They borrowed all the money out of there anyway, but they're actually going to reach that point. We have reached the point that the people who spend, your spending peak, according to all, all records, is 46, by the way. At that point, you peak in your spending, and from that time on, you spend less and less as you go down. Now, that's, that's a matter of record. How do they gauge things? Do you know that the baby boomers peak is this year of 46? That means in the future, the government has less income coming in than it does today. And we need more, not less. Everything we're pointing to is we're pointing to a collapse that's coming of monumental proportions. All right, back in Genesis 48. I said, did I watch? What, 40, no, I'm sorry, 41, 41. Where do I want to go again? <laughs> Genesis 41. You know the story, so I'm just going to skip through this. This is the time when Joseph had to, had to read the, the dream of Pharaoh. In, in Genesis 41, verse 25, so Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he's about to do. And they go through the story of the seven good cows and the seven lean cows, of course. And then you have the stalks of corn, seven, seven lean, seven good. And they both said the same thing, right? So we had seven years of good and seven years of lean. Have we gone through our seven years of good? I don't know that I can look ahead and find seven years of good anywhere out there. I kind of got this feeling now that we're 2007 was like, the end of our two <laughs> seven years of good. And now I don't, I can't put the time frame on, so don't put me into that. But I'm looking at principle here, what God's telling us. I honestly believe our years of good are over. So whatever you can stock up and store, whatever your bills you can pay, whatever you can spiritually get ready for, because I'm going to come to that in just a second. You need to focus on that. You know, you need to get out of our mind. Well, I'm going to get this resort on this island here. You know. Not that maybe you didn't, you know, but I, I always did. So, you know, I like to go to this island somewhere and be away from everybody and live out tribulation by myself. I don't think that's going to happen. It's kind of selfish when you think about it. Just me and the wife and the kids, you know, away from the whole world. Let them have their problems. Well, you know, God isn't going to let that happen to his people. you got to be out there serving if you're going to be a part of that first resurrection. When we was on a cruise, we got a chance to go on a cruise for the first time, first vacation in oh, 10 years, best. I'm looking at all these islands. I wonder if this would be a good spot for tribulation. <laughs> I did. I really did. I was like, I'm this crazy guy out there, you know. And I'm looking. It's like, man, I got some mean people down here. I said, where y'all get y'all's water from? Oh, we ship it in from here. What about your food? Oh, it comes in them boats over there. It's like, man, I don't want to stay here during tribulation. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, like, I couldn't find a place I really want to be down there. Maybe there's some islands somewhere else, but that wasn't some of them. All right, so here we go. Look what, look what God says. Verse 46, we'll pick it up. No, no not 46. Uh, let's see. Oh, verse 39. So we don't know what he does. He begins to store, put everything aside, and said, Pharaoh told Joseph, for as much as God showed you all this, there is none so discreet as you or as wise, and you should be over my house and according to your word at my People be ruled only the throne will be greater than you. So Joseph, knowing what was coming, what did he do? He takes 20% of all the land of Egypt, 20% of all the land of Egypt, and he begins to grow. 
and he began, began to store. And they had to build bins. In fact, they think they found some of those bins now, these huge bins with the grain. In fact, they said they, they had so much food for seven years, they could no longer keep count of it. And through that, Egypt became the most wealthy, powerful nation at that time. But what was the principle? There's a storm coming. You better start getting ready. And I'm telling you, there's a storm coming. This storm is going to be beyond anything we can ever have dreamed. You need to get ready. You're looking at that $35,000 car. Can you live with a $20,000 car or a $10,000 car or a $5,000 car? You can get the nicest car on earth, but if you can't get gas to put in it, what's it going to do you? I watched the mentality of the Japanese people. It's unbelievable. I was in the middle of something just the opposite down in New Orleans. There's a lot of hatred in this country. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of demand that you owe me. And I'm going to get what I, if you don't give it to me, I'm going to take it. And I watched the demeanor of the people over there. No looting. Unbelievable. No looting, no shootings, no killings. They're in line waiting peacefully. They give them boxes to go pick out a certain amount of food. And they trust that that's what they're going to do. They needed water. So you know what they did? They all got together for this place for water. And they formed an assembly line with these little buckets of water. So they all worked together to handle their needs. What a mentality. You're not going to find that in this country. What's coming is bad. All right, let's move on. Look at Exodus. Look at Exodus. Some, some people believe that you will be taken to a place of safety. And if that happens to anybody, God bless you. The church has come to understand that it's not going to happen in that way. Especially if you're in a place of safety when Jesus Christ returns and he sends his elect, his angels to get the four corners of the earth to gather his elect. But then in one spot, where is he going to go get them from? Why is he got to go some all over the earth? But when we see the book of Psalms and we see what's coming through here, Exodus chapter 7, verse 14, the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is heart and he refuses to let the people go. We see in this chapter he begins the plagues. The duality is unmistakable of the time of Egypt and going into the promised land and the end time. Going into captivity is the same. The duality in time. So now, where are the children of Israel at this time? They're, they're in Egypt. They haven't left yet. The plagues begin. You think they might have got a little thirsty too and the water turned to blood? They went through some discomforts and hardships too, by the way, of what they were going through. Chapter 8, the frogs. Where are the children of Israel? They're still in Egypt. They got the frogs too. They haven't been taken out. They're still in harm's way. Now, the, the, the plague of uh, lice, verse 16. What about them? Well, they're there too. So in other words, God is going to allow us to go through a certain amount of the troubles that's going to besert, become, befall this earth. You know, I said that God's going to let you be tried. You're going to go through a lot of hardships. You're going to go without. If you read Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think it is. I read this, I guess I've read it before, but for the first time, Last year, Moses is recounting all the things that God did for the Israelites. And you know what he says? He told the Israelites, when you came out of Egypt, you lacked nothing. I said, wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm reading they were hungry. They were thirsty. They didn't have water. They went for days. They didn't get to change clothes. There was no bathing going on. God says, you lacked nothing. I read that scripture. I said, we need a mind adjustment of what we're going to need. I teased my wife, said, man, I don't want to go through tribulation without air conditioning. <laughs> I said, I'm kind of mean to deal with when I don't have my air conditioning. Well, I'm going to have to get used to no air conditioning. I may have to get used to a lot of things that I have today, some of the comforts that I have. I may have to get used to getting hungry just a little bit. It's not until this area here, verse 23 of chapter 8, he says, I will put a division between my people and in your people, and tomorrow will be the sign. From that time on, God begins to separate the plagues that come upon Egypt. God's going to place His protection around His people. He's going to give them the safety that they need. But when did the Israelites come out of Egypt? When it was all finished. When did God take him out on eagle's wings? When it was all done. When did they go to the promised land? When God had accomplished His task. When are we going to go into the, into the millennial reign? When God has accomplished his task, 
He's going to take us out just like he did the children of Israel, he said, in Egypt. And they didn't leave their homes until the, the plagues were over. The duality, again, is unmistakable. Now, they had to do one more thing to prepare. How else did they have to prepare? Let's go to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12 in verse 22. It says, You shall take a bunch of hyssop and you shall dip it in the blood and in the basin. And you shall strike the lentil on the two side posts and the blood that is on the basin. And none of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning. For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lentil and on two dog posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not permit, permit the destroyer to come to your houses to smite you. You and I must have the blood of Jesus Christ. So when all these things begin to happen and these death people go out there, just like back in Egypt, he will look upon you as he did back then. And in your heart, he will see the blood of Jesus Christ. And these areas will pass over you and shall not hurt, hurt you. Go quickly to Ezekiel, because I'm almost out of time. I want to go to Ezekiel, and then I'm going to close in Psalms. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 9. Ezekiel, chapter 9. Now, as you know, Ezekiel was the prophet sent to Israel to warn them so they don't go into captivity. However, they were already in captivity. That means that the warning message of Ezekiel was to a modern day Israel, which is you and I. Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 1, he says, And he cried in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city, draw near every man with a weapon destroy in his hand. Very similar to what we read in Exodus when that death angel goes by. By the way, the death angel, God says, was the Lord. Go back and read that. I'll give you one more little side note to give you something to study. Write this down. Look at when Moses went to Pharaoh. When someone says you're going to go to a place of safety because God's talking to one man. If it is the same when it goes through that, you read what God says. When God told Moses to take Aaron and go to Pharaoh, you know who else went with Pharaoh? We got this picture in our mind. It's just these two guys. That isn't what the Bible tells us. The Bible says take the elders of Israel with you. That's interesting. How, how come we never read that for the last 40 years? God's clearly telling them, when you go to Pharaoh, why? Because God says out of the mouth of two witnesses, his word is established. So God, if he's going to do like he did in the Old Testament, there's going to be witnesses of what God says in advance before anybody does anything. And if it's not done according to God's word, then don't do it. Now just a little note on the side. Go back and read that. See if I'm not making that up. Prove that out. God sent Moses with, a, with the, the elders of the tribe of Israel. There's a lot of people there. Who knows how many? There was at least 70 because we know when they came out, there's 70 elders out there. So there's at least 70 people with Moses and Aaron when they went in there. Read it. If you never read it before, go back and study that. It's amazing what we miss. The church is always focused on certain things. But it's in there. Go back and read it. All right, we're back in Ezekiel now. God is sending now. This is an end time message. He's sending out the destroyer into this city and he's to the Jerusalem. And the Lord says this, verse four, the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city and through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark on the foreheads. We always talk about the mark of the forehead of the beast. We don't have the mark of the beast in his hand or his forehead. We're not going to be able to buy or sell. You got to be willing to go without. You're not going to be able to buy or sell. In the foreheads of the men who do what? Who sigh and cry for the abominations that are done in the midst. To where the blood of Jesus Christ means that you are willing to sacrifice all. That means that you are willing to follow him. That means that when you see the abominations that goes on in this world, it rips at your heart and it rips at your soul. And just like of God's creation, when it sees these abominations, what does the creation do? It says it vomits them out. Is sick of what's going on. And you and I need to reach that stage in our lives that when we witness what's going on out there, we don't become a part of it. But it makes you sick. And you cry and you sigh for the abominations that we see out there. And so when God sees that and those death angels go out there, He's putting a mark on you to protect you so that you will be safe from what's going on all around you. 
from what's coming on. Now I want to close with, not, not close with this, but I want to finish this chapter with this, verse 11. And behold, the man in, with linen who had the ink on by his side reported the matter, saying, I have done as you have commanded. What did God command him to do? Well, he put a mark on his people, but you know what else he did? Verse 6, this man said, I have done this. Go and utterly slay, old and young, both maids and little children, and women, but come not near any who is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. God's going to begin with his elect, with his truth, and his church. And if we have people in God's church who are not holding fast, and we look at Matthew 25, and it says that half are asleep, and half are awake, and their oil has gone out, God says it's going to be too late. He's going to come back. And he's going to let them slay them. And they're going to be apart with the rest of the world. We need to be awake. And we need to be prepared more than we ever have before. That's why I've spent so much time in these first three months. When I see the news that's going on out in that world. It's happening so fast you cannot keep up with it. And our people are asleep at the helm. And we need to help wake them up. And get them back to Jesus Christ. Forget about who's fighting who. Forget about who's wearing what name tag. Who's on what organization. We need to focus on Jesus Christ and the return. Because what good is it going to be when all this happens? Place Well, I'm a part of this organization. So what? That's not going to save you. Only the blood of Jesus Christ and the mark that God has put on you is going to save you. And it ain't going to be near a place of safety. It's going to be right where you are. You know why? Because he's got people he's going to send to you. He can't send them to you if you're somewhere in hiding somewhere. It's funny how we do something. You know, we preach against a rapture. And we preach a rapture. I believed it for a lot of years. In fact, they got me thrown out to church. I, I, you heard that story? I said, I said, this deacon comes to me one day. Uh, by the way, uh, Ray, don't do this. This deacon comes to me. He goes, uh, you're not on my list. You're supposed to be on my list and I don't have your number. I said, what list is that? He said, that's the list to go to the place of safety. I said, you got a list for that? He says, oh, yeah. And I'm thinking like, well, how does that work? He goes, well, God's going to tell Mr. Herbert. Mr. Herbert tells the evangelist. The evangelist calls the ministers. The ministers tell the deacon. They call me. <laughs> so, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now I'm in a bad attitude. I said, what if I'm out in the field planting or I'm at the show and I miss the phone call? You mean I don't go to the place of safety? He goes, yeah. So, oh, whoa, whoa, something's wrong with this theory. I said, I ain't buying this. You're in a bad attitude. You're out of here. That got me thrown out of the church. <laughs> Best thing ever happened to me. I got to. I actually had to go start studying from then on because I didn't know it. I thought I was just doing it. I was listening. So, it wasn't. but it wasn't. It, it, let's go to Psalm 91 before I get carried away. Psalm 91. You might have been through that. Some of those things. Psalm 91. Look what God says. You ever thought about that? How's he going to send people during the tribulation if everybody's put away somewhere? Psalm 91 says, He who dwells in a secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. That is the final stage of your preparation for the end time. Yes, you do. You pay all your bills. You get everything. Get your house in order. You, whatever you can put aside. If you got some food, some dry sweat, fine. That's not going to save you, but you still do it. Do what you can do. I mean, you can't. You can't become a hoarder. I know that's not going to work. And food's going to. By the way, if you got a whole lot of food and they, everybody else is getting skinny around you and you're still holding your weight, they're going to look at you and say, "This guy's got food," <laughs> and they're going to come after you. So that's not going to save you. Only God's going to save you. So the final stage is this. You do everything you can possibly do to prepare. And when it comes, you lock the door, so to speak. And you get rid of it all. And you trust God. And it may be staying right where you're at. There may be areas that you're going to come together as families. Because you've got nowhere else to go. Down in New Orleans after the hurricane, they had several families living in the church building. And they would go out and work during the day and come back. Until they get their things in order, and one by one, they eventually went back home. One guy never did go home. He's still there. He became our groundskeeper, by the way. So uh, he loves it there. We can't get him out of there. We can't pry him out of there. He says, verse 3, he says, He shall surely deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Remember, God says he'll begin to separate what's going on around you. 
He says, And you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that wastes at noontime. A thousand shall fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand. It's going to happen. It's not going to be peaceful. It's not going to be pleasant just to say, Well, thank God I'm not part of that. It's going to hurt. There's going to be friends. There's going to be family members. There's going to be people that you know that are going to be suffering and hurting. There's going to be a time of suffering that God says, man, when you read the scripture in Revelation, that God says from this time forward, blessed are the saints who die in, in the faith. So, wow. That God's going to say it's better to die in faith than to live any longer after this. That's a bad time that's coming. That's a disaster that we can't put in our minds and comprehend at this particular time. But we have to try. Because that's coming. And you and I need to be ready for it. 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thy. He says, only with your eyes shall you behold and see the reward of the wicked. He says, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, the habitation, there shall no evil befall nigh neither either you nor your plague come near you or your dwelling. He says, for he will give angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways and to bear you up in the hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And you shall tread upon the lion of the adder, and the young adder and the lion, and the serpent, and shall trample under the feet. And it's talking about all the things that's going on. Because he has set his love upon me, he says. Now this actually transferred into Jesus Christ. And you've seen with some parts of what was being transferred into that also in duality. Because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him, and I will set him on high, because he has known my name. And he shall call upon me, and I will answer him, and I will be with him in trouble, and I will deliver him with honor. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Our preparation is, is now. It's not later. You and I are preparing for the most important job on the face of the earth. is to care for those that God's going to bring into our care. That's what this day has been all about. This afternoon we are being blessed to have three new people who are willing, who have chosen, who have examined their life and says, this is is what I want. I want to be a part of the body of Jesus Christ. That job has been given to each one of us to be a part of. When that happened, it's so important, God says, that the angels in heavens rejoice over that day. I hope I've pricked your thoughts and your conscience. I thank you for allowing me to be here. It's been a theme for the first three months. I hope you don't get tired of listening to that. But if you listen to each one, you'll see that I am approaching all of these aspects from various angel, angles to try to help us prepare for the return of Jesus Christ. May God bless you and the works ahead. We look forward to this afternoon, the baptisms, and the fellowship that follows. <music>